Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a happy Easter. Happy Easter. To all of us gathered here and also those gathered online here from the First Presbyterian Church in Branchville, what a delight to be able to be celebrating this day together. We were hoping that things would, in fact, start up online, and I'm getting the high sign from Patrick, who's filling in for Dimitri. Dimitri, by the way, had surgery on his foot, so he's out for a little while, so so grateful to Patrick for filling in. But Patrick came up earlier and said, it keeps bumping me off of things. So now we're on, and we'll hope with thumbs up and with God's grace, it'll stay connected, even as we are connected to God's grace. So friends, let us celebrate this new beginning as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning again, and happy Easter. Please join me in the call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray together. Holy One, you come to us with power beyond all knowing. You lift all things out of the dust. You breathe love into every cell. You call us into communion with you, and you claim victory over death. Blessed be your holy name, now and forever. Amen. I invite you all to rise in body or in spirit and join in... Sorry, singing hymn 
123, Jesus Christ is risen today. Please be seated. Jesus rising from the dead assures us that we too have been given new life. Let us repent of our sin before God and one another, certain of God's mercy. Please join me in unison prayer of our confession, followed by a time for silent prayer. Let us pray. All-knowing, all-powerful God, we confess that even on this most holy day, we are unable to believe in the victory over death shown to us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. We confess our utter dependence on you, not only for life, but also for faith, hope, and love. Without your astonishing appearance to our ancestors and your stunning presence throughout the ages, 
we would be lost. Forgive us and transform us that in every way our work and prayer will make whole what is broken and give peace on earth. Holy God, accept these, the prayers of our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, which we offer in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let all the people say, Amen. 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 By the grace of God and the witness of our ancestors, the good news of Jesus' resurrection is our rock and our salvation. We shall not die but live. The cornerstone that the builders rejected has become our strength and our song. Brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, we are forgiven. Please ride together, either in body or in spirit, and join in singing a new version of the Glory Patri, found on page 577. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us share signs of reconciliation and peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Now please greet one another with the peace of Christ.
Thank you, choir. Please join, uh, please join me in the prayer for illumination. Open our eyes and soften our hearts, O God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, that in the hearing of your word, we may receive new life. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts of the Apostles, from the 10th chapter, beginning, beginning at verse 34. Please listen now for God's word. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to all the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread through Judea beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They then put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm 118. Let us share God's word. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. As you say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord is well exalted. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Mike. Turning now to the Gospel of Mark, we hear Mark's account of that first Easter morning, which comes to us from the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. 
Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have to confess there are many times when after watching a movie or reading a book, I wish there was a, a different ending, a better ending. Maybe it's true for you as well. Uh, for me recently watching the Western series titled Longmire, that is the poster child for a lousy ending that needs a better one. You know, if it's been a good story, we want it to continue. If it's a com complicated story, with many characters, numerous twists and turns in the plot. We want all those loose ends tied up very neatly. We want the folks we love to be alive at the end and the ones who deserve not to be, not to be, and maybe blown away for good measure. We would like that, right? When it comes to the ending of Mark's gospel, it's not very satisfying. He, his ending to the gospel seems to leave out the very best part. There are no resurrection appearances of Jesus, no stories about him walking through closed doors or speaking with the disciples. It seems a little incomplete, as though there should be a better ending to this story. Others must have thought so too, because if you check it out in the, in the Bible, Mark has several added on endings that add a few things because somebody along the way thought, no, Mark, you've got to do more than just that. The version, however, that I read for you this morning is, by all accounts, the original one. The Bible, as many of us know, contains four Gospels. Oh, there are others, but the four that made it into the book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course. There's also a Gospel of Thomas, a Gospel of Philip, a Gospel of Peter, a Gospel of Mary. There are lots out there. But these are the four that the church, in its wisdom over the years, said, these are the ones that tell the story, these are the ones we need, and it's enough. Chronologically, Mark came first, even though he's not listed as first in the New Testament. The others come later. Maybe it was in response to the rather abruptness of Mark's ending that Matthew, Luke, and John each record other experiences of the disciples with their risen Lord, to give it a more complete, a more satisfying ending. But even there, each gospel's different in its details, incomplete in one way or another. Nevertheless, there is one detail that is complete, that is consistent throughout. Jesus Christ, who is crucified, dead, and buried, is not in the tomb. He has arisen, thank God. And it is amazing news. It's news that's, frankly, you know, be rather hard to, to write about, much less to find a perfect ending for, because it's hard to find a more perfect ending than the fact that Jesus is arisen. Way back in the day, there was an old-time sports writer named Red Smith, who told a story about the novelist and filmmaker, a guy named Lawrence Stallings. You may know him because he was the director of the original Jungle Book and the writer of the Western, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. You know these things, but it's back in the day. At any rate, Stallings was given the assignment of covering a football game between the University of Penn and the University of Illinois, the year 1925. Now, Stallings was no sports writer, and there on the field was the living legend, Red Grange. That afternoon, that brilliant halfback broke loose for three touchdowns and helped with another one. And here, all the seasoned sports writers up in the booth are having a field day. But meanwhile, Red Smith says, there's Stallings pacing back and forth, shaking his head, rubbing his head, saying, I can't write about this. It's too big. I have to wonder if the same sentiment brought people like Mark up short 
when they got to the part of the gospel story where they had to try to describe something that none of them had seen and yet all of them had staked their lives upon, the resurrection of Jesus. With a story as big as this one, how do you keep it grounded on earth? How do you keep it honest? How do you give it that ring of truth? As we look at Mark's ending to this story, you may have noticed the last word in the story is afraid. With terror and amazement, they fled the tomb because they were afraid. <laughs> Victor Borga fans would know that that's the period you put in when you're talking. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or maybe that's an exclamation point. Can't remember. Anyway, doesn't matter. They were afraid. They said nothing to anyone. They ignored the angel's instructions. They just skedaddled. Fear would be a very honest reaction to the angel and the empty tomb. Bruce Larson tells a story of a guy in his book, Living Beyond Our Fears. It's a guy who made the mistake. He was in the bathtub, and he reached up to turn out the light. His poor wife found his body sprawled in the tub. He was pronounced dead, put into a crypt overnight, but during the middle of the night, he came to. He went over to the garden tapped him on the shoulder. You know what that guy did? He skedaddled. He was worried how he should contact his wife, so he got to the phone and he barely got the words, oh darling, it's me, when he heard her fall to the floor. <laughs> he finally decided, well, maybe if I call somebody from another town who hasn't heard that I've died, maybe they can spread the news. And that's what happened. There is fear in the thought of someone who is dead coming to life. You know many of the classic horror stories. That is the main plot twist, right? To add that extra bit of terror and suspense. The women at the tomb expect to find a dead body to anoint. They can deal with that in spite of their grief. But how are they going to react to an empty tomb? To an angel? To the news that Jesus has in fact arisen. I think the first honest response has got to be fear. A professor friend of ours at one point said, you know, if you're not afraid, you don't understand. The women, terrified. And why shouldn't they be? For the other angle on this is that they were among the disciples who deserted Jesus in his hour of need just a few days earlier. And if Jesus is back from the dead, well, what's his attitude going to be? How will he deal with his followers? It's rather interesting, isn't it, that the angel says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Why does he get singled out? Is, because, is it because he's the one who particularly, as we know, three times denied his Lord? What kind of, in, uh, of a reunion is that going to be like? Is he going to get his? Who wouldn't be afraid? But what else is at work here? What else might give rise to this first reaction of fear? The one that has staked their lives upon, put to death by the government and religious leaders of the day, now raised, vindicated by the power of God? And if God's done that then the world as they know it will never be the same again. Everything is turned upside down with Jesus' resurrection. I imagine, you know, given time, they could have come to terms with Jesus' death. They would have moved on with their lives, gotten over their grief. As we know, everything does end in death, after all, a death of one kind or another. But how are they supposed to deal with Jesus' life, with his resurrection presence here and now? That is a fearful prospect, to be sure. You know, I think we can adapt ourselves much easier to God's absence than to God's presence. And this joyous message of Easter in our songs and in our celebration in 2024, it kind of bypasses that honest first reaction of fear. And I think it's right that Mark records 
that before the joy. That old ending called death has been rewritten and a new and a better ending is available for those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. For the believer, death is no longer like the extinguishing of a light, but it's rather putting the light aside because the dawn has come. The darkness is no more. This is the story of our faith that continues to move us and to motivate us, to fill us with joy and fear. Because we have to remember that we are not just Easter observers, we are Easter participants. God has gotten the last word, but that story continues to be written and rewritten, and we're called to be a part of it. The gospel writer Mark draws us in, you and me, to be participants in this story. And so the power of Jesus' resurrection continues. This story, our story, the story of the church of Jesus Christ that continues to move and live and have its being in him. And it's this church, it's all of us who are called to set aside our fears, as real and as legitimate as those may be, and instead take up the joy of the resurrection as, as we continue to encounter Jesus in our daily lives. So the question before us is, don't you want to be a part of that story? Won't you allow the risen Christ to draw you in and then lead you out to serve him with, yes, at one time, some, some fear because we don't know where we're going, really. But nevertheless, to be filled with this unquenchable joy because Christ is alive and nothing will be the same ever again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I invite you to rise once again in body or in spirit as we join together in singing hymn number 122, Thine is the Glory. Oh! 
Let us remain standing and proclaim what we believe using the affirmation faith found in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We proclaim Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one, confessing him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we acclaim Jesus as the Lord of the Church, the head over all things, the beginning of a new creation. We acknowledge that we live and work between the time of Christ's death and resurrection and the final consummation of all things which he will bring. We are a pilgrim people, always on the way towards a promised goal. On the way, Christ feeds us with word and sacrament, and we have the gift of the Spirit in order that we may not lose the way. We will live and work within the faith and unity of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, bearing witness to that unity which is both Christ's gift and his will. We affirm that every member of the church is called to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Together with all the people of God, we will serve the world for which Christ died, and we await with hope the day of the Lord Jesus. You may be seated. And again, welcome to worship on this beautiful Easter morning. Several announcements to share with you. First of all, there's a lot of them in the back of the bulletin. Please take a look at them. Something new this week. You may have noticed there's name tags, and some of you are wearing them. I once had someone, well, I should say more than once, in a congregation, there's always someone who says, I'm not going to wear a name tag. Everybody knows who I am. That may be the case, but somebody new won't know who you are. So if you don't find your name tag out there and you would like one, please let us know in the office or talk to David or myself or Sandy Carlisle, who is your lovely and um, helpful usher today. There is no coffee fellowship today because we assume you are all going to celebrate this day with family and friends elsewhere. This Thursday, this will be our last of the series on the portraits of Jesus that we've been doing. We have one more, and it's about the resurrection and death and life, so it's going to be a good one. It's the last one. And then the week after that, we will start a new series, How the Bible Came to Be, if you've ever wondered how to make sense of it, we'll try and do that. Also today, we are um, taking an offering, and we'll take it even after today, for one great hour of sharing. This is an offering of the entire Presbyterian Church and others, and the money goes to help um, not only worldwide, but it helps in our own community as well. So if you can give generously, that would be great. Um, the beautiful flowers over to this side are from the service for Jolene Newcomer, which was yesterday morning. Um, a witness to the resurrection and uh, to the love that the community and family had for Jolene. Also, I would like to say thank you to Dawn and John and the choir and the bells. We have been here Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday morning, and today, and they've been here for everything. And we are so grateful for their talent and their service and their willingness to share that with us. So thank you all very much. Now, our joys and concerns for today. Florence um, Fidelis prays for world peace. Lisa O'Hara has prayers for Charles, Fred, and Chris. Michael O'Pillo would like us to pray for Tom Coulter, Paul O'Pillo, and John and Connie Dudas. Mary Hall Kinney would like prayers for Bob Fetter. Tex Lewis Hoskins says, I pray that a pastor is found. The Stillwater <laughs> Church. Oh, we had a pause there. I, I know. It's for Stillwater. For Stillwater. Um, I have to tell you, I was ordained in the Stillwater Church. 
Uh, I have to tell you that church has been closed for two years, three years, which is very sad. But it, the, the congregations of Stillwater over the decades, over the century, fulfilled their call from God for their mission. And it was time. So I don't think they're going to find a pastor. We're going to have a new one here. Not right away, but it will happen, I promise you. Um, Kathleen wants prayers for the people of Baltimore and for Mike Kalamanis. And Krista McCallum, prayers for John Newcomer as he faces the grief and loss that comes with Jolene's death. Olivia Campbell, pray, prayers for healing. And then today, prayers for Bob Price Sr., for Darla and Rich, for Larry, Roger, Bob, Anita, Robin, Kenny, Barbara, and Amy and Beth, all dealing with cancer, for Karen and for Joyce. There are so many prayers that we keep in our hearts and our minds, and God knows them, and God will hear them. So let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we do come to you with prayers. We come asking for your help, for your healing, for your compassion, for your comfort for those who grieve. We come with prayers of joy and give you thanks for the many blessings that you have poured out among us and upon us. Especially today, of course, we pray with thanksgiving and joy for the resurrection and the promise for all of us to one day be raised from, dead, from the dead and from this life to live with you. Gracious God, in a world that is broken, where so many things have gone wrong, where so many people are left without the basic necessities of life, we ask you to keep us mindful so that our hands and our minds and our hearts may serve on your behalf. We especially ask prayers for the people of Baltimore and for all those involved in that horrible, horrible accident. We ask for prayers for the people of Gaza, for those places in the Sudan where there is violence. We ask that you be with our children in this country. May we continue to honor who they are and teach them and love them. We give you thanks for this congregation and all the many ways that they respond to the call from you to love one another, that greatest commandment of all. So, gracious God, we give you thanks and we give all of our prayers to you in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. In the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We indeed have been blessed richly and sometimes we take it for granted but today especially Think about all the blessings that we have in this life and how can we share with those who ha don't have enough. This is one way. We share what we have with the church, which then, in the name of Christ, serves those who are in need. So if you are at home worshiping with us online, there are ways to give in the back of the bulletin. But let us take our offering now and share what we have.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, the creatures here below. Praise God above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving and dedication, which is found in your bulletin. Holy God, you shower us with gifts so abundant, we cannot measure them all. You give us life itself and the power to befriend our companions in this world. Bless these gifts for the sake of those in need. Bless the work that is supported by the one great hour of sharing. May we all do the sign of your love for all. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and sanctifier, one God, now and forever. Amen. Remain standing for hymn number 105. <clears throat> Back a while ago, I was at a conference and uh, one of the presenters talked about how she had given up a tenure position because when she was debating on it, she heard a voice asking her, what would you do if you weren't afraid? 
And then she knew what she needed to do, which was to go a whole different direction, which didn't have all the security and all the other stuff, but it was the calling that she had for herself. And that's really our question when we come to not just this day, but any day. What would we do if we weren't afraid? How would we live our lives? What might we do differently? Martin Luther talked about how there were times when he was afraid, and he'd get up and he'd say, I am baptized. That was his connecting link. Maybe on a day like today, our connection is Jesus Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Why do I need to be afraid? So friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, and the love of God and the abiding presence of God's Holy Spirit may it rest upon us all this day and evermore. And let all God's people say, Amen.